Brothers and sisters, welcome to this part of the service. We'll be spending some time in the first chapter of Philippians today. I'd like to start with a short little story. In 1993, while fishing in St. Mary's Glacier, Colorado, Bill Jiraki got his leg pinned under a boulder. Snow was in the forecast, and he was without a jacket, a pack, or communication. In a desperate attempt to survive, he used his flannel shirt as a tourniquet and then used his fishing knife to cut off his own leg at the knee joint. He used hemostats from his fishing kit to clamp the bleeding arteries, and then he crab walked to his truck and drove himself to a hospital. How badly do you want to live? How desperate would you get if you got pinned somewhere? And how much joy do you find in living? The title of our sermon today is Joy in Living. And I'd like to start just by jumping into Philippians. But we'll be taking a look at the background to this passage. I'm not sure how much we want to live if we had to maim ourselves or possibly die in the process of trying to save ourselves, and yet desperate measures or desperate times call for desperate measures sometimes. So Philippians 1, we'll just begin with the first two verses. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints with Christ who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is beginning his letter to the Philippians as a greeting, and this is about ten years after he has been in Philippi starting a church. And if you remember, Philippi is a city a little further north and west He had traveled on a trip, he had met Timothy, and he found Timothy in Lystra and Derby area, and he took Timothy with him. He said, I want this man to be with me, and he took him with him on these missionary trips. And there was an area he wanted to go to, but but the Lord continued to forbid him to go there. And then he had this vision, and so we'll read in Acts 16 about that experience of going to Philippi and planting a church in this area. What was Philippi like, or what was going on there? How did this church begin there in the first place? So we'll read Acts chapter 16. Then he, Paul, Paul and Silas, came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed. But his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in faith and increased in number daily. So he's actually revisiting churches he's been to before. And Acts 15, they had just come from Jerusalem, where the Jerusalem council was given. What to do with these believing Gentiles? Do they need to become circumcised? Do they need to follow the Jewish law or not? And they were delivering the decrees that the apostles had given in Jerusalem. Verse 6, now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in a night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately he sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city in that part of Macedonia, 
a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. This girl followed us, Paul and us, and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed, and the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep, seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the officers, saying, Let these men go. So the keeper of the prisoner, prison reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore, depart and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison. And now do they put us out secretly? No, indeed, let them come themselves and get us. The officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Little town of Philippi. The town of Philippi, some say, was modeled after Rome. It was like a little Rome. It was a pretty important town, but it was a, uh, a smaller place. And their first experience there, they found three people that needed the Lord. And obviously more, uh, these people's households came to the Lord. At least two of them did. We don't know for sure about the slave girl. But we, we find this interesting person, Lydia, possibly a more wealthy person from another place, had moved to this place. She was a seller of purple. And she and her household were God-fearing. Uh, she was at the river. It's interesting to note that Paul went to the river on a Sabbath because typically when he went to these different cities, he went to their synagogues. 
But here he went to the river because he knew they were praying at the river. And this lady, Lydia, came over and listened to what Paul was saying. And I find it interesting, a, a woman of some importance, and she listened and she took what Paul was saying and believed. And she and her household were baptized. So there was the beginning of a church forming. And what also kind of surprises me is how many days Paul and Silas were okay with having this this nuisance, this, this girl, a slave girl of somebody's, just following them around and stating true statements about Paul, saying, these guys are saying the truth. These guys are telling you how to get saved. But it happened for days, and finally, they were annoyed enough to do something about it. Is that when we finally uh, pray for, for deliverance, when we finally get annoyed enough that somebody is being tormented by a demon? I'm not sure, but I just find that fascinating. And and we don't know for sure what happened, but she was delivered. Did she become a follower of Christ? Uh, We can assume that she did, but we don't know for sure. Um, But here's a slave girl, probably a very poor person, um, in spiritual turmoil, but popular to a certain degree because of the money she brought to the area. And then we have another person who became a believer, He was, I don't know what you would call him, probably a blue-collar worker. He had a job. Uh, He was kind of a practical man. Um, You can sense his practicality when he notices that everybody's gone or that he thinks everybody's gone in in this prison after this earthquake. What's the most practical thing to do for a jailer who knows that he's going to be tried and killed? He'll just quickly kill himself. He's a practical man. He doesn't have much spiritual direction, but he's just indifferent, spiritually indifferent. But when he heard Paul and Silas were still there, and we can assume that he heard their singing and their praying, but we can assume that he's heard many things in jail, and he doesn't pay attention to those things. But he knew enough about Paul and Silas that he came to them and begged them, begged them to tell him what must he do to be saved. He knew that they had a different story than what most people had. They had, they had something to offer him that would change his life. And he brings them out, and as he's wa- washing their stripes, his sins are being washed away. And it's just a beautiful story, again, of his whole household coming to the Lord and believing. So back to Philippians. Now we're uh, approximately 10 years later. We don't know for sure. But approximately 10 years later, Paul is in, we assume, the Mamertine prison. And we have the first slide, a picture of the Mamertine prison cell. The Mamertine prison cells were in Rome, and and you can still come and see this particular cell. There was a first level, and then you could go down to another level, and you see the hole in the floor. That's how they let the, the, uh, the prisoners in. Not a very large place, probably very dark, because the first level was ground level. There's another level down below, and possibly more levels. They said that the sewer system was also down at this level, and if you were in the lower level, you could pop a door open and you would be in the sewer system. And it was typical that these, if, if people were in these prisons, you were not expected to come out alive. Either you were um, killed in, in this cell and taken out through the sewer system, or possibly taken out and killed some other way. So we can imagine Paul He's in Rome, and he doesn't know if he's going to live long. He doesn't really think so, but he, as we read, we realize he, he knows that he wants to continue to live. This, this, um, he would rather live and serve, but he would also want to go and be with the Lord. But being in a prison cell and writing a letter, writing several letters to different places, and then sending Epaphroditus with the letter and delivering these letters... Let's continue to read in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. And we will um, notice especially here in the very beginning that he has a lot of joy. He is just exploding with joy. He seems to be the happiest man in Rome while sitting in a prison cell. I'm not sure how that's possible. Um, 
I think most of us would find ways to complain or feel sorry for ourselves, but he seemed to be the happiest man in Rome in spite of where he was at. Verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine making requests for you all with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. You all are partakers with me of grace, for God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with affection of Jesus Christ. And we'll pause right there. This book of Ephesians has over 20 references of, to joy, but I'd like to just specifically point out, and I won't turn to all of them, but I'll read the little phrases of how much joy Paul had. And you, you just notice right from the start, start, he's making a request for this church in Philippi. He's, he's in bad condition. He's in prison, but he's praying with great joy in his heart for this group. And he remembers those times in Philippi with great joy. And he tells, he's, he's so grateful that these people are his partners in the gospel. Paul prays with joy in chapter 1, verse 4. In verse 18, Paul rejoices that Christ is proclaimed. We'll, re, we'll get to that later. In verse 25, Paul will remain living on earth for the Philippians' joy in the faith. Chapter 2, verse 2, Paul asks the Philippians to complete his joy. Verses 17 and 18 of chapter 2, Paul is glad and rejoices with the Philippians. In verse 28, Paul sends Epaphroditus that the Philippians might receive joy or might rejoice. And in verse 29, he tells the Philippians to receive Epaphroditus with joy. Chapter 3, verse 1, he tells the Philippians to rejoice in the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 1, he tells the Philippians that they are his joy. And verse 4, he tells the Philippians twice to rejoice in the Lord. In chapter 4, verse 10, Paul rejoiced in the Lord at the Philippians' concern for him. There is so much expression of joy, but it comes from a level of deep affection and love for these people. Some who read this section think that he's maybe almost a little bit cheesy on his love but he really, really seemed to have a connection with them. And um, I find it interesting, if you compare this with some of his other books, he, he really seems to have a really close connection with them. There were some other places where he prayed for them as well, and he mentions his prayer, but in this place, his prayer is just overflowing with, with joy and with love, but he wants them to grow more. He wants them to experience more. This church supported Paul financially as they were able. This church was actively involved in sharing the gospel. This church had established leadership. There were uh, bishops and deacons at this point, so it, it had grown since Paul had first been there. And I like the way Paul has this joy of anticipation. Verse 5, I'm sorry, verse 6. He had, he was so thankful that he could be confident of this very thing, that Jesus, who began a work in the church at Philippi, would continue to do the work until it was completed. Now, as, as we think about our work, Jesus begins a work in our lives, and when he first begins, we're not perfect. And as we go along, we realize more and more that I don't think I'll ever become perfect. But we have confidence that once we've been made righteous in Christ, that Christ will continue to do His work. And that work is to continue to sanctify us, to continue to make us more like Christ, to shine like Christ, to look like Christ. And God will complete the work He has started in us. The work that's already been done is continuing to be worked out in us. Paul had confidence in Christ completing the work. There was a joy of affection. Paul longs to see them again. He had this brotherly love of Christ in them, a heartfelt affection. 
because they both had the love of Christ. They, they had something in common. And when he talks about this love, it was deep in his heart. It was almost like a gut level, or they, they talk about in, in the Old Testament this in their bowels, or deep inside of them he felt something called this love and affection for his brothers. Let's go to verse 9 and re- read verses 9 through 11. Here he finally gets to his prayer. He says in the beginning, verse 3, how he was thanking God and how he prays for them. But here is his prayer. What is he praying for them? And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Just a beautiful prayer of love. And I think he had a lot of confidence that they were already experiencing this. They were already growing in love. But he wants their love to continue to grow, to abound more and more. And take a notice of what he says, that your love may abound in knowledge and in discernment. So when we love, I just mentioned that sometimes we have this deep, deep heartfelt love that comes from deep inside of our bosom. But there's also a knowledge. And he says he wants their knowledge to grow so that they will learn how to love better, that they would abound in love with their knowledge. What is it like to have knowledge about what to love? We need the knowledge of God. We need the knowledge of God's Word, or we will fall into loving things that are selfish. And this knowledge of God helps us understand what we ought to love. We need to put our relationships under God's authority and ask God these questions. What does the Word say about my relationships? Do I have knowledge of the Word? What does God say about my relationships in my life? What does the Word say about dating and about marriage? Do I have knowledge of what the Word says? As, as lonely men and women have sought relationships outside of God's plan, many have made shipwreck of their lives. But if you know the Word and you submit to the Word and you grow in love of the Word and of Christ's ways, I think there's a lot of safety. What does the Word say about loving your enemies? Do you have knowledge about what God says about loving your enemies? Some other things that we need to have knowledge about. How should I love my friends? How should I love my coworkers? How should I love my children? The Bible speaks to how we should love our children. How should I love my nation? And how should I love the least of these? As we think about these things, we realize we really do need knowledge of what Christ wants us to love. And as we have a better knowledge of what we should love, then we will be able to abound in that love and continue to grow in that love. And then he goes on and says, discernment. Can we grow in love that is discerning? Knowledge asks the question, what is right? And as we read the Word, we grow in knowledge. We know, okay, this is right and this is wrong, and we grow in knowledge. But what about discernment? Discernment asks, what is best? Can I devote myself to what is best and love those things? We need discernment and wisdom to know how to love people best. This prayer of love that grows in knowledge, this is a prayer of love that grows in discernment, and this is a prayer of love that approves what is excellent. Deeper maturity in Christ. There's a... uh, Verse, verse 11, this, this whole thing of being filled with the fruits of righteousness, choosing what's best and aligning ourselves with what's best, having actions in our lives that honor Christ, but fruits of righteousness coming out of our lives. I would like to invite you to stand for a word of prayer. Well, I have a several prayers that I want to pray together as part of this sermon. So you may stand, and we have a prayer here. 
all together. Father, please increase our love for one another. Help us love one another based on our knowledge of Christ and His Word. Grant us discernment to know how best to express Christ-centered love to one another, as well as how to express love to the outside world. Fill our hearts with the love of Christ. May our love for Him who took hold of us cause us to love others more sacrificially and genuinely. Through Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This approving things that are excellent seems to be a thing that Paul really wants us to grab a hold of. It requires discernment if we want to approve what's excellent. But we put things to the test, or we examine things. Um, This that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense. The word sincere had a a unique meaning in the time of of the Roman people. There was probably more than one, but sincere actually meant without wax. And there was a lot of sculptures that would make marble sculptures. But what would happen if you're, if you're chiseling away? It, chiseling is on rock is not easy. You, you pop the, right, or the wrong place, you, you'll knock something off, or you'll knock off too much. And so if, if these sculptures would pop off the lobe of an ear, they, they discovered that if they would mix marble powder with wax, they could make it look just like marble, and they could fix pieces that, where there were blemishes. But there was a problem. Once this bust was done, and they would bring it in to display, and on a hot Roman day, there would be wax running down this bust face. And here it speaks about being sincere, and the sincere also means that you could bring it to a light, and you could examine it. And if if we think about ourselves, Paul was praying that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere, that you could hold yourself up to a light and examine what were you like. Did you have wax on you or were you truly sincere? Were Were you made of the real stuff? Were you examined and proven to be the real thing? And then without offense or without blemish until the day of Christ. And this was Paul's prayer for the, for the Philippian church. And I believe there was a lot of reason for there to be good things. We believe that good things were happening in Philippi, but he wanted them to continue to grow, to go further than that. Here are some practical questions for us to consider whether we are approving the best things. How sincere are we? Let's put ourselves up to the light. Am I pursuing knowledge of Christ with passion? Am I valuing knowing Christ above everything else? Am I attending church to grow in the Word and have fellowship with others? We're proving what is best. Am I doing what is best with my life? Am I doing what is best with my time and with my money, even with my mind? Where does my mind go? Do I choose to do everything that I do, even my thinking, to do what is best for my mind? Am I doing what is best with my children or with my business and with other relationships? Am I doing good things or am I doing gospel things with my life? That is a test of our sincerity. And may we grow in this. You know, I'm I'm very thankful that this is a prayer. Because if if this said that they were perfect in all these areas and uh, that somehow I'm failing, because I realize I really need to grow in these areas. And these fruits of righteousness, this, this way of being really sincere and always approving what is excellent, having discernment, I don't always have that. But I'm grateful to see in a prayer because that helps me know that I can pray for the same thing and allow Christ to work with me and in me. In verse 11, it says that these things, which are by Jesus Christ, we don't drum them up of our own strength. We really must rely on Jesus working through us. He is the source 
I invite you to stand again for another prayer. Father, grant us wisdom that we may pursue what matters most in life, knowing Christ, loving others, and making Christ known. Grant us purity of motives. Keep us from envying other Christians, complaining about people, gossiping, competing for praise and recognition, pursuing our own ambitions. Help us to love and serve for in all our relationships, help us to do what is right and what is best. Through Christ we pray, amen. You may be seated. We'll shift a little bit and look at verses 12 through 26 now. And we'll continue reading in verse 12. But I want you to know, brethren that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ, even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of, of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labors, Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. We'll go back to verses 12 through 18. We, we have this section of Paul speaking actually of, of some of the other suffering. So he's in a prison cell. That's not very comforting. It's not very comfortable. And uh, he, he talks about this rejoicing. He's just grateful to be there. He's grateful to serve the Lord in any way he can, whether it may mean death because he's in prison, and it's not likely that people come out of this place alive. Yet he has this other conflict. There are people preaching Christ, and it seems like now that he's in prison, there's other people that want popularity and power, and, and some of them maybe even want to do it just to, to poke at him. I, I don't know how you would preach Christ in such a way that the other person in prison would somehow feel bad, but he says that's what they were trying to do. I, I think there was some selfish ambition. I think people were trying to find a way to, to kind of glean off of Paul's popularity. But whatever it was, he chose to be grateful. And, and I, I, it makes you wonder, what were they preaching anyway? Let's turn to Galatians. What did he say in Galatians? He wasn't near as kind to the Galatians when, when something was happening there. Galatians 1 verse 6, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Okay, well, Paul is definitely clear when there is perversion of the gospel of Christ, he does not go along with it. But here in Philippians, I don't know how they were preaching. It must have been a little bit different because he's at least saying, I'm so happy that they're at least preaching Christ. And he's also grateful that there were people who were sincerely preaching the gospel of Christ. 
knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. They knew that Paul was in the same gospel that they were preaching. And somehow, Paul continues to find joy despite the suffering, the imprisonment, the conflict. I have a a little story here to read about Peter O'Brien. Peter O'Brien was a missionary, and this story is told by D.A. Carson. When he was a youth, Peter, neither of O'Brien's parents were Christians, but his mother became greatly impacted by the faithful witness of a neighbor. This neighbor was a simple lady with sincere faith in Christ who unfortunately lived with an incurable disease and suffered day after day. But she never complained. Her attitude and witness made a tremendous impact on O'Brien's mother, who eventually trusted Christ as Savior. Humanly speaking, it was because of this simple lady's faith that O'Brien's mother became a Christian. Because of that, O'Brien, Peter O'Brien, later believed. And he would then go on to seminary and get a PhD. Then he would go to India and make the gospel known for years. Then he would go to Australia, teach, and write several extraordinary commentaries. Now, suppose you had said to this simple, suffering woman, here's the deal. If you will glorify Christ in your suffering, then as a consequence, Indians will be converted, pastors will be trained to teach the Bible, countless sermons will be preached. Will you now suffer faithfully every day? I'm sure she would have said, yes, of course, I can endure for these reasons but she didn't know all of this would happen. When we're in the middle of suffering, we don't know what God's accomplishing. And Paul was in the middle of suffering, and he didn't know what God was accomplishing, but he had full confidence that God was accomplishing wonderful things because of his suffering. And he was able to trust God He continued to share the gospel. He cared for his brothers. He shared the good news to the prison guards. He loved Christ, and he believed Christ was worth every piece of suffering that he endured. Verses 15 through 18 talk about the selfish ambition that we've referred to. But in the end, Paul talks about his life. What was it really worth? Was his life worth living? Well, he had experienced many things, and and I think he could say at any point, I've lived a good life. He did at one point say, I fought a good fight and lived a good life. I've fought the course that I've been given, but I find it fascinating that Paul always lived fully in the present, and he said in this case that whether by life or by death, I will magnify Christ with my body. For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. I'm not sure what the conversations were like with the prison guards. Maybe they were telling him, hey, Paul, we're going to kill you. And he says, oh, great, I get to go to be with Jesus. Um, On second thought, we're just going to keep you alive after all. Oh, great, I get to serve the people in my church. Well, we're going to make it real hard for you. We're going to give you a lot of suffering. He says, I am so happy to suffer for Christ. Paul was an impossible opportunity. He was just so optimistic, and nothing stopped him, even though he was in hard times. What do we live for? Paul lived to be with Jesus. It was really clear. He wanted to be with Christ, but while he was on earth, he continued to serve the ones he who loved Christ and who had a similar vision. Is my highest ambition to live for Christ and to honor Christ? What if that means that I have to rely on Christ completely and all of my other securities get knocked out? Can I still represent Jesus courageously? Can I live with this unstoppable attitude that Paul had? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I have another story, like the first one. In 2003, 
Aaron Ralston had a similar experience of being pinned under a boulder. While hiking in Utah, a boulder fell and pinned, on his, pinned his arm. After various attempts to get free, on the sixth day of being stuck there, he amputated his right arm with a dull multi-tool. Exhausted and dehydrated, he then rappelled down a 60-foot cliff and hiked eight miles before finding a Dutch family who guided him to a rescue helicopter. He eventually made it to a hospital and survived. And he wrote an autobiography entitled Between a Rock and a Hard Place, an appropriate title. How badly do you want to live? And is what you're living for actually worth living for? Because Christ is worth everything. But can we find joy in all the things that we go through? What is robbing me and you of the joy that we could have? According to what uh, Paul writes in here, the things that give him joy are things that we can also find joy in. We find joy in prayer and in thanksgiving. We find joy in fellowship and brotherhood. We find joy when we partner with the gospel with other believers. We find joy in the assurance of the salvation that God will continue to work in us what He has promised He will give. I invite you for the final prayer. This one I will just pray, but you may stand for the final prayer. Father, our greatest purpose in life is to glorify Your holy name. Fill our affections with a passion for Your glory. Through Jesus, give us power to glorify You in our lives, in our homes, in our church, in our cities, in our world. Grant us power to glorify You by the way we love, by the way we think, and by the way we live. Help us to live in view of the coming of Jesus, our righteous, our righteousness, our Lord and King. In His name we pray, amen. You may be seated.